you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. How is the Suzuki Method related to writing? How can students get past the blank page roadblock? And how can limitations actually increase creativity rather than decrease it? Listen carefully for the practical answers on today's podcast. Today's podcast will have several surprises and interesting practical approaches for teaching and learning. I have interviewed many fascinating guests for the podcast, but you will be hard-pressed to find a better overview of powerful learning ideas on a single podcast. If you've ever played a musical instrument, you've probably heard of the Suzuki method for learning to play the violin. Today's guest has had the privilege of studying directly with Dr. Shinichi Suzuki. His insights from working with Dr. Suzuki have significantly influenced his current passion of inspiring students to write with excellence. Andrew Pudawa understands learning at a very deep level. His experience with Dr. Suzuki and subsequently in starting the Institute for Excellence in Writing have common themes which we discuss in the interview. So without further delay, let's meet Andrew. My guest today is Andrew Pudawa. Andrew has a long and interesting story about how he got into his career in writing. He studied music in Japan after he was in college for a little bit. And the unusual twist there is that in his current career as the founder of Excellence in Writing, he actually teaches writing and composition, but he hasn't finished his degree in that. Excellence in Writing does workshops around the world and across the country. In those workshops, they teach students to think better by writing better. So, Andrew, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I founded the Institute for Excellence in Writing in 1995 while I was still working as a a full-time violin and kinder music teacher. I um, had discovered this method of teaching writing with structure and style uh, when I went up to a a teacher training seminar in the early 90s, and I met James B. Webster, who had written this book, uh, Blended Composition um, Instructions, uh, Yes, blended comp- blended structure and style and composition, sorry. And uh, I saw this system was very similar to what I was doing teaching Suzuki method violin, that it was a, a system where you knew what to do next. There was uh, checklists and models and things that were very concrete, ways to concretely communicate them to students. So I got excited. And I started to do some classes and, and some workshops. I got an invitation to a couple uh, homeschool conferences where I went out and did some conference talks and just kind of built up gradually. Then in uh, 1999, I, <coughs> in 1999, I was busy enough to go full time into uh, making this work. So since then, I've been to five countries to teach internationally, including uh, plus the United States, uh, 45 of the 50 states. I've done workshops and whatnot. We do probably most of our work is with homeschoolers, but uh, we're expanding into hybrid schools, private schools, and even quite a number of public school districts now. And so it's been very successful and very exciting for me to see the results now after being at this for for. 15, almost 20 years, I guess, uh, students who learn our system are really very, very competent in being able to organize and present ideas on paper. And as you mentioned, again, it seems like the, the unexpected side benefit is that when you learn to write well, you actually learn to think better also. So can you tell us a little more about this method and some of the um, some of the core constructs that you use to get students to actually write better or in a more organized fashion. 
Sure, sure. You know, um, you've got children. You've even got grandchildren, you told me. So uh, you've probably heard this, but very often you'll meet children who don't like to write. Uh, and, and when you meet these children, very often their biggest problem is they don't know what to write. Have you heard, have you heard kids say, I don't know what to write. I can't think of anything. Oh, oh I, I, I was say. that kid. I was that kid. I, <laughs> it has and, taken and me I, a long time to, to actually start to get past that. So um, I'm, I'm actually personally very interested in what you do. Yeah, I, I was that kid too. And I remember, you know, sitting in class and the teacher would go, okay, children, today we get to write stories. And, you know, I'd get like, once upon a time there was a, uh, and then, you know, nothing, just blank, tears dripping on my paper. Inevitably, I'm sitting right across the aisle from, you know, some girl who's four pages into her next novel. And I remember <laughs> looking at kids thinking, how can she do that? You know, come up with, produce something from nothing in, in a way. Uh, so our system is actually based on imitation. We start in Unit 1 and 2 by providing the content, the source text. So we get a little Aesop fable or some interesting information about a person or a place or a, a dangerous or interesting animal, something that is age-appropriate in terms of interest level and also reading level. And we show the children how to make what we call a keyword outline by taking uh, two or three keywords from each sentence in that short little article, put that in an outline, and then kind of remove or ignore the original, look at the outline, and try to reconstruct that content to, to retell that fable or retell that information, at first verbally and then in writing. So they're actually um, immediately free of the problem, I don't know what to write about, and they've got content to retell, to reconstruct, to represent. And uh, this gets almost every reluctant writer over the hump immediately. And then uh, through our nine units, we move children from that blank, you know, that, that dictated content towards the blank page. How do you think of an original idea or um, actually I don't believe anybody has much in the way of original ideas but how do you get something just out of your brain onto paper and so we have these units which are steps so unit three we give them a story they don't get keywords from every sentence but they take notes on the key elements of the story the character setting conflict climax resolution and then retell that story fairy tale myth parable um, uh, then in, in unit four and six, we go back to working with facts, uh, basically nonfiction report writing, where there's too many facts. So you can't take keywords from every sentence. You have to choose, you know, of the 10 or of the 15 or of the 500 available, uh, which ones do you want to represent, make an outline, retell that. Unit five, we have writing from pictures, which is a very important kind of weaning step. It's a bridge between here's the story, retell it, and make it all up on your own. You don't get a story per se, but you do get a set of pictures and a methodology of extracting ideas from your mind about those pictures. And then in unit seven is what we call inventive writing, uh, or creative writing, but invention is a process that you go through. It's a word used in uh, classical rhetoric, actually. And so that's where we find that, you know, now children have the uh, aptitude for working with transferring ideas from one place to another. Now, Unit 7, transferring those ideas from their mind to the paper. And then Unit 8 is where both strands kind of come together. It's the essays where you collect facts and organize them, and then you have your opinion, your own thoughts that you add to those facts, or uh, you have an opinion and you go collect up facts to support that opinion. Uh, because we all know that having an opinion without facts to support it, well, that's just kind of obnoxious. So we, uh, we work with Unit 8, and then Unit 9 is a critique, which would be uh, like a book report in response to literature. So what I have discovered over the years is, is that rather than saying to a child, you have to think of something in order to learn how to write, that if we teach students how to write using imitation models and checklists, they then actually become better in learning how to think of stuff. And, uh, I, you know, it's funny, I, I have tried this experiment many times 
and it's fun. You can go out and try it. Ask someone. Ask a group of teenagers if you've got one. They're, they're the most fun. How do you think? How's it done? If someone says, think now, how, how do you make that happen? And what's fascinating, Steve, is almost no one can answer this question. They kind of look at you blank. Honest kids will say, I have no idea. Usually, the most common answer I'll get is, um, you use your brain. Okay, great. <laughs> How do you use your brain? Um, I, you just think of stuff. You know, it just happens. For many people, thinking is kind of a, you know, a passive, intransitive verb. You know, if you just wait around long enough, something will come to you. Um, but what I've, what I've figured here in working with students and writing and, and content, particularly in, say, coaching them to answer the, the prompts for the SAT or the ACT type of test, right, um, it's a think on demand. Read this and think about it and say what you think and be as articulate and intelligent as you possibly can. You have 25 minutes ready, set, go. It's a weird activity. Um, but, but see, the, the trick to communicate this to students is it doesn't actually come to you. It comes from you. Getting Thinking is getting stuff out of your brain. And so how do you do that? And I always tease them, say, you know, if you want to be good at getting stuff out of your brain, just imitate your mom. She knows how to get stuff out of your brain. <laughs> if you know something <laughs> and she wants, to, she wants to know what you know, She'll, she'll ask you questions, right? Where have you been? Who else is there? What are you doing? Why are you late? How are you going to clean this up? Your, your mom becomes a master question asker. So the, the trick is to become a master question asker to yourself. And then you can engage in this invention process. But I think one of the reasons so many kids have trouble with that is because the educational system that we have in this country is actually not designed to produce thinking people. It's designed to produce controllable, obedient, uh, predictable factory workers, voters, and consumers who will do and buy and vote exactly the way they're told. You give them a couple false choices, Republican or Democrat, Pepsi or Coke. And, and so the system itself that I came through, and I see it very clearly in retrospect, is actually designed on an industrial model. So everybody learns what to think about things, and if you learn that, you don't need to know how to think, and you become very controllable, very predictable. Um, so I'm all about actually radical different type of education that is aimed at teaching students how to think by giving them the skills to ask good questions. And uh, I'm sure that you've probably seen some of those those things in in your life as well. Oh, I'm I'm actually listening to you talk about writing, and writing is not my strength, but uh, inventing and building is my strength. Um, I, I can start from a blank page or a blank workbench or however you want to think about it with stuff, and just create things. And it's taken me longer with writing, but after listening to you and watching what we do in our company, actually, the there's some there's some uh, striking patterns actually because we do something with our uh, teenagers in our summer camps that's very similar to what you're talking about we do we call it templating but it's basically uh, emulating uh, some other project or taking a project that's almost done and taking out one or two pieces and having them fill in the blanks but it's this idea of having something that already works or almost works and then working from there and it's like the brain just figures out the pattern and and solves it, and then, like you said, if you ask the right questions, out come the answers. I, I like it. I think that's fascinating, actually. And and you you're touching on on something that is um, very very important in developing any kind of skill, whether you are playing a musical instrument or learning a sport or drawing or inventing or writing. Um, skills are acquired really through imitation through modeling and imitation. So your idea, I love that. In fact, I would probably enjoy coming to your summer camp having heard that idea uh, where here we have something that's, that's pretty much set and now you get to finish it. That's, that's kind of just like what we're doing with keyword outlines. You've got the idea, now you get to represent and finish it as you would like to. And uh, this idea of imitation is so important. And sadly, 
um, we've we've kind of lost it. Uh, while education, the system is based on an industrial model, we've at the same time made kind of creativity the god of modern education. So, you know, in the in the 70s and 80s, um, if it was creative, it was good. If it was good, it had to be creative. And how dare you, you know, sh show a child how to do something too closely? That would inhibit his creativity. How dare you have him, you know, imitate or, or practice something that's already existing? That would stifle his creativity. And sadly, the results of that idea have brought about the lowering of basic skills to where creativity for many people is is almost impossible. Uh, one fascinating thing I discovered, um, actually didn't realize it till I started to study Latin about five years ago, um, the word invention comes from the Latin root invenio, which means to find or discover. Um, however, when we look at the, the English derivatives, not only do we get invent and invention, we also get the word inventory. And what's an inventory? It's the stuff you have. And so to do an invention, you have to have some stuff to work with, you know, either mental stuff or physical stuff. And that just kind of so wonderfully underscores the fact that human beings really don't produce something from nothing. Uh, either conceptually or physically, uh, you know, only God does that. The rest of us are kind of stuck with what we've got, you know. You have to have ideas in order to represent and combine and permute those ideas. I'm sure you've probably seen that. Well, actually, I, I've thought quite a bit about that. There's a actually, I do watch TED Talks. I, I, I'm a, a little bit of an addict, and there's a, there's a guy, um, right at the top of my head, his name isn't coming, but I'll link it up in the show notes, but he's got a, a video in and a presentation he calls it embrace the shake and uh -huh. he's an artist and his creativity as an artist actually grew out of a limitation that he discovered that he had that he at first did not like but he learned to accept the limitation and then the limitation itself became the catalyst for well how could I get around this limitation to do something really amazing and he has created some of the most amazing art and after watching that video, I actually started looking at what we do in our classes. And uh, curiously, uh, we actually take some of the resources and we limit them in the class. And the results actually are an increase in creativity, not a decrease. Mm. Mm. That is very interesting. Um, then then you've, you have parameters. You've got you've got guidelines, there's limits, and you don't feel as though you, you have to be able to do anything or everything. Um, we, we see that same thing with composition. When we give kids a structure to follow and a checklist of things to do and then word lists to be able to choose from, it's kind of like uh, said to me, independent of each other, this is kind of like the Legos of language, you know. You give the students all the pieces and they can be very creative in putting them together in a multitude of different ways as opposed to, you know, here's paper, express yourself. It's almost like throwing them a blob of clay and say, make something beautiful. You know, you, you that that's very, very difficult for most people. So interesting, that idea of parameters and limits. Well, I'm actually in the curious, creative process. You know, listening to you speak about this, you know, from your perspective, because you're coming at this from from a almost a different. Well, it's certainly a very different practical outcome from the writing side. But uh, you know, just thinking this through as we're speaking, <clears throat> I wonder if you know the mind uh, in when when you have too many resources actually kind of gets the blank page effect and when you reduce the resources suddenly the mind says oh i know what to do with that and starts creating these you know interesting ways you could use a small number of things Th that part i'm not sure about but i do know that when when we limit um you know some of the resources in our classes that students do seem to create more creative things but when you give them too many options they it's almost like they don't know what to do with them yeah Over overwhelm and uh, that's what I see. A lot of times kids, um, they get overwhelmed with the complexity of the process 
of writing or playing a, a new piece of music or, or drawing picture. The, 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 the whole is so large and so complex, they don't know where to start. Whereas a, a good teacher, a coach, um, a model and a system can help them step through that overwhelmingly complicated process just by saying, here's the next step. Here's the next step. Here's the next step. And as they walk through with that coaching, um, you know, several times or many times, then they start to get a sense of the whole, and they can, in essence, start to coach themselves through that process as well. I would, I would guess that inventing is is pretty much the same. I, I mean, as I'm listening to you speak, I actually, it actually sounds very similar. And I hate to do this to you because I, I think there's a whole other interview in this direction. But one of the things we like to do is find out, like, how did you get here? So we're going to start uh, rewinding the clock, if that's okay with you. And I, I'd like to rewind it just a few years and ask you, how did you come up with the idea for the excellence in writing framework? Like, where did that come from? Well, I actually learned the system from a Canadian professor of history, African history, oddly. He was at a teacher training course that I took in 1990, I believe, was the first time I went up in northern Alberta. I am not Canadian, but I was working at a school, uh, teaching music, actually, at a school where there were some teachers that said, let's all go up and take this summer course. And so I, I did. It was a 10-day teacher training course, uh, and it was just fascinating because because I was, as you mentioned, um, a, a kid who never really liked writing at all because I never knew what to do. I never knew what to say. I, I didn't have a, a system. And when I saw his system, I realized two things. Number one, I can do that. That's actually kind of fun. And number two, it's very similar to the Suzuki method of music instruction that ah. I had been train, trained on in Japan. I lived in Japan for three years and studied with Dr. Shinichi Suzuki for three years. Uh, so I, you know, I'm kind of a Suzuki purist, if you will. I understand it very well. And I thought, this is exactly the same. It's, it's got a repertoire. It's step by step. You only go to the next level of complexity when what you've learned so far has been mastered. Um, it's something that's universally applicable. And so I just looked at it and said, this is a Suzuki method for teaching English composition. And so I came back and I taught some English classes uh, in that school. The results were so excellent. Um, they surprised me. They surprised the kids. They surprised the parents. Uh, we surprised everybody ourselves. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I went the next year and I took that same 10-day course again from the same man, Dr. Webster, and I thought, there's more to learn here. I mean, this is this is rich. And the third year, I said, could I come up again? They said, well, if you're going to come up, we'll put you to work. So I, I actually ended up joining the staff of this little group of Canadian teachers. And every summer for, oh, seven, eight years, I went up there. And then uh, I, I said to Dr. Webster, you know, I would like to teach this uh, to primarily to homeschoolers in the U.S., and would that be okay? And he said, absolutely. And so I, I started the business, you know, with his blessing. I still um, am in good contact. I see him a couple times a year. In fact, just last week, I went up to visit him in Vancouver. He's 89 years old, uh, but still sharp as a tack, and uh, I bring him papers that my students have written, cringing, knowing that uh, he's, he's going to critique them as harshly as possible. Uh, but we have a great relationship, and I don't think he ever imagined that I would be able to bring this to dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of children uh, all over the world. Um, and through, you know, through the power of video, we've been able to create a course that can train teachers, tutors, and parents um, pretty well. Um, it, you know, it's not quite a, quite a live seminar where you can get your questions asked, uh, but we have a, a support system within our organization so that anybody who has a question can certainly contact us, and we have a teacher certification program where we will actually uh, have teachers send in their own writing as well as some of their student samples and uh, accredit them at various levels. And uh, so it's just very exciting to see how that that recognition of what I saw as, hey, this is a system for teaching writing, just like the most successful system in the world for teaching violin or music, uh, and I can do this. And, and here's the really great thing, Steve. 
Um, Dr. Suzuki, and I don't know how many of, of your listeners will recognize that Suzuki method or know anything about it, but Dr. Suzuki was not trying to create a whole world of violinists or musicians. He was trying to demonstrate to the world that you could teach children anything, even something as extremely difficult as playing a musical instrument. You can teach children <laughs> to, to do this, and you can teach all child that talent can be developed. And that's why it's actually called, in Japanese, it's Sai no Kyoiku, which is translated either ability development or talent education. And, and so Suzuki was trying to use music to show the world a better educational system. And, and so in a way, even though I don't teach violin anymore, I feel like I'm even more on mission because I'm out there showing people how to apply these principles of ability development in the area of writing and other areas of what we would consider you know, academic type of education. That is fascinating. So I, I need to ask you, <clears throat> I need to ask you a question about Dr. Suzuki, but I think I, <laughs> there's just not enough time in this interview because I need to rewind the clock again and ask you to tell us about uh, maybe all the way back to grade school, middle school, high school. What, what, was it, what was your education like and how did, you, how did you eventually get into the Suzuki school and meet oh Dr. Suzuki? Like, so, what, <laughs> so, so start early and, and lead us through that journey so we, so we understand. Okay, um, well, I, um, my mother said to me that I was begging for a violin from the time I could talk. Um, so when I was uh, right around five years old, um, she found a Suzuki violin teacher. Uh, she was a piano teacher herself. She found a Suzuki violin teacher in Southern California where we lived, and um, this was the pioneer. I mean, nobody knew about Suzuki Method in 1965. It was, it was definitely new to America, and so I was kind of on the, the very first little ripple of American students to, to start learning that way. Um, I played the violin and grew up, uh, went to high school, quit, you know, as you kind of do when you get to be the teenager and kind of fool around with the trumpet and the, the drum so I could be in the marching band and not have to do P.E. Um, <laughs> I, I don't remember much about school except um, techniques for surviving boredom. Um, my, my greatest memory of school is just surviving being bored. Um, and the older I got, the worse it got. I, I mean, I can remember so very few things about high school at all. I think I only would remember two names of two teachers the entire time, um, and life started when school ended. You know, because that's when you could you could go out. And I I was very interested in war games and and creating games. And so my little group of friends, we were all uh, war gamers and fantasy gamers. And I got into that that whole thing. And then I wanted to work. I've always been very entrepreneurial. I started my first business at 16 when I discovered that you could buy wholesale and sell retail. So I bought war game <laughs> supplies, um, carried around in the trunk of my car and would sell them to my friends. Um, and I, I worked, I worked in a McDonald's uh, for about six weeks. I said, there has got to be a better way to make money. Uh, worked in a pet shop. That wasn't quite as bad. And then I got a job in a war game store, which was kind of the, the perfect job. And then I realized you can make a lot more money um, being a busboy and a waiter. And so I, I did all that and I got, you know, good grades. But I was the kid who would never bring a book home, you know. I'd do the math homework in the science class and the science homework in the English class and, you know. <laughs> I, I should oh. not admit that I that I did that. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I took the easiest classes you could, and so you know, I got a decent GPA and a decent SAT score, and went off to San Francisco State, where I just I don't remember anything really. Um, I remember a, bi a bit of biology class. Uh, I remember um, reading Kant, but other than that, it was you know just really not a very um, <laughs> noble life I was leading there. Um, and, and then I w went transferred over to UC Santa Cruz um, mainly because I was kind of getting into my, I don't know, uh, 
environmental side. I wanted to be an environmental business person and make the world a cleaner, better place. But I just, you know, I, I then got involved with a, a church and and I decided the whole purpose of, of living was to benefit your soul. And so I, I quit school and I went to work for that church um, a couple years, uh, basically volunteer and somehow this church that had a school connected with it, somehow they discovered, I think from my mother, that I had played the violin. So they said, well, you should teach violin. I said, I haven't played the violin for years. Well, sure, well, you can pick it up and teach our kids. And so I thought, all right, whatever you want. And so I started taking lessons again. And uh, one summer I decided that I wanted to really learn more about teaching, and I went to four um, – Back to back, four weeks doing teacher training, uh, Suzuki Method teacher training institutes in four different cities. I did what no sane person should ever do. I took a bus from San Francisco to New York. Oh wow, Ithaca, New York! Um, uh, if you're going to do it, do it when you're you know 21. Um, and what I what I discovered was that there were in the world of violin teachers I met people who knew what they were doing and people who obviously didn't. And I thought, if I'm going to make a career out of this, actually, I want to be one of those people who knows what they're doing. Yeah. And the teachers I really respected, all of them had either been to Japan for a period of time or had been very close to someone who had been to Japan for a time. So I you know, convinced my dad that since I dropped out of college and cost him any more money, he could help me go over to Japan. And, <laughs> and, uh, he did. And once I got over there, I discovered you could support yourself in high style by teaching English conversation. You didn't really have to know any grammar or anything. They just want to pay you money to sit around and talk to them in English. So I supported myself there for three years, studied with Dr. Suzuki, uh, got a certificate and came back and started uh, teaching at actually the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential, um, which is a place in Philadelphia that specializes in training um, uh, parents in child brain development to help brain injured children. And uh, they had a school mostly for the, the people connected with that organization. So I taught violin in the school there while I learned all about child brain development and how to help brain injured children who can't walk learn to walk or who can't talk learn to talk or who can't see be able to see. And uh, so that was a fascinating period of my life as well. So what was, uh, what was your interest in going to, uh, to the institute there? Well, um, I had an opportunity to read – um, a trans an interview between Dr. Suzuki and Glenn Doman, and when I read that interview, it was almost as though, you know, God Himself spoke to me and said, "That's where you need to go." And so I wrote a letter and I said, "I read this thing, and I've now got your book, and I am, I am convinced that I should." I should come there and, and work for you. I'm finishing up in Japan. I know you have a school. I know you know all about Dr. Suzuki. I don't know if you need a violin teacher or not, but but I really feel that's where I, I should come and work for you. And they wrote back and said, well, we don't really need a violin teacher, but we're always interested in young people who are interested in what we're doing. Uh, we actually will have a team of people in Tokyo in a few months, and if you want to come and meet us there and see what we do with brain-injured children – um, you're welcome to come and, and stay with us in Tokyo. And, and they put me up in the hotel, and I, my, whole, my, my whole world was shattered because I had never consciously thought about brain-injured children. You know, when you're young, you see people who are different. They're just different. And the fact that, that these people could, could – the parents could do these programs that would actually – you know, fix the brain. It was just just mind blowing to me. So I said, "Sign me up." I don't even care if I teach violin. <laughs> I I'm I'm all in on this. So again, I I moved to Philadelphia. I worked there basically volunteer. I think my stipend was fifty dollars a month plus room and board. Um, so it was it was you know basically volunteer for for that time. It was very fortunate that the the violin teacher of the younger children that they had she had to move because her husband got transferred so she left about six months after i got there so i was able to teach violin work in their very progressive international school and uh and then uh in the afternoon and, and the weekend i would work in the clinic with the brain injured 
families of brain injured children. And um, the knowledge I gained in that three year time period has just been uh, phenomenally helpful because now when I meet you know, young parents who've got kids with, with problems and issues, I understand very well what's going on and I can kind of point them in a direction that, that is probably better than just random or, or going through the medical establishment or whatever. Wow. Well, uh, we have about run our course, so I need to get to our last two questions. Um, okay. So the, the one question we always ask coming to the end of an interview is in a digital world – where you can go download a paper off of Wikipedia, for instance, and pretend like it was your paper. Um, and, but good professors will always know when it's when it's from Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> in that environment, though, where there's so many resources, like what does the word educated mean? Like if you put quotes around educated, what does it mean to be educated in that environment? Well, I I would argue that the definition probably really hasn't probably really hasn't changed to be educated in my view is to have the tools for learning and whether you're getting that information from a library or a digital library it really doesn't matter um, well educated people throughout all history have acquired the tools for learning which then allows them to continue learning and I would argue that those are the seven liberal arts. Um, from the ancient Greeks all the way up through the Renaissance and even into what we have now, a, a modern version of, quote, classical education, those seven liberal arts are grammar, logic, rhetoric, that's the trivium, the three, and then the quadrivium, the four, is mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and music, or what you might call harmonics. Those are the liberal arts, the liberal part meaning the arts of free people, as opposed to the practical arts or the servile arts. The liberal arts are those things which you learn uh, so that you will be able to retain your, your spiritual and intellectual, if not also your physical freedoms, and those are the tools for learning that you would use through your whole life. That is the type of education that truly great men through history have had, whether you want to go all the way back to Alexander the Great, who was a student of Aristotle, uh, or even into our founding fathers like uh, Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams. Um, they were schooled in those arts, grammar, which allows you to understand and, and use language, logic, which really is how to think, systematically. Rhetoric is how to use language and thinking to persuade people. And then, of course, the qualitative measured arts of, of mathematics, geometry, and astronomy, and music. So I would say a person who is pursuing knowledge and mastery in the liberal arts, and arts are things you do, not just things you know, but things you do, that is going to be, has been, and, and always will be in the education that we need for leadership, for freedom, for um, the best possible destiny. So you've already touched on it, and the last question we always ask is, what is the purpose of an education? So maybe you tie it up with a neat little bow. <laughs> well, I'll just quote my friend Andrew Kern, who didn't make it up. He quotes other people all the time, too. Um, but I, I would say the purpose of education is to cultivate wisdom and virtue by um, by nurturing the soul with goodness, truth, and beauty, which can be apprehended through the human senses and abilities that are developed with the liberal arts. Is that good enough? That'll do. Thank you so much, Andrew. I, I appreciate that. Uh, that has been quite a ride. I, uh, I, I, we, when we got going this morning, I, I, I'm always curious where an interview was going to go, and this didn't go where I expected, and those are always the most fun. So thank you, Andrew, for taking some time to talk to our audience today. Uh, uh, a pleasure, and if, if you want to uh, do it again, we can you know, explore the fundamental principles of Suzuki Method sometime. We can talk more about writing. We could 
go you know in depth into the liberal arts uh those are all things that um uh, I love to talk about and and you, maybe you can think of some ways it builds more of a connection with <laughs> with your world and your clientele and uh I will uh recommend a couple people for you because I know that was on the website I didn't fill that out but uh we'll do it it's been been really fun so what is the best way for our audience to uh, to get in touch with you if they're interested in uh, learning more about what you do? Well, we have a very easy and comprehensive website, IEW.com. Bought a three-letter domain name. I thought I would never spend that much money on anything like that, but it's nice. Uh, IEW.com, and we've got all sorts of articles and free audio downloads and video clips and things that people are welcome to um, use and, and learn from without buying a thing. Um, there's also some uh, videos of me doing talks on YouTube, so you can just Google up that name, Pudewa, P-U-D-E-W-A, and then if you have a specific question, uh, send it on in uh, by email, that's fine, info at IEW.com, and we'll get it to the right person, and um, anyone who's interested, we've got some great Great stuff for teachers and tutors and students of all ages. Well, thank you, Andrew. My pleasure, Steve. That was a powerful conversation. I think I need to go back and listen to it again myself. Those ideas of learning mastery by repetition when the mind is young and pliable and the technique of templating new concepts are extremely powerful educational tools. We try to keep our episodes under 40 minutes, which is about right now. If you would like to hear some additional reminiscences of Dr. Suzuki from Andrew, keep listening after the closing music. To learn more about tabletop inventing and what we do, go to ttinvent.com forward slash more about. That's T-T-I-N-V-E-N-T dot com forward slash M-O-R-E-A-B-O-U-T. Don't wonder about the future. Work with us and we'll help you create it. I'm very curious. I had not known that connection to Suzuki, and I might actually have to go look up books if he has, if there are any books written about it. Do you know if there are? Um, well, his his books. Um, I would recommend the first one you read, um, and you can get it off Amazon for one cent because there's so many you know, used copies floating around. Is Ability Development from Age Zero. That's what I would recommend as a go straight to the source. And if you want an overview of fundamental ideas of Suzuki method, um, I would suggest SuzukiAssociation.org. Uh, they've got some easy literature that would kind of walk you through. Here's the the five pillars of uh, uh, sorry the four pillars of Suzuki method. The earliest period, start young. The right environment. Uh, the right kind of teacher and the right methodology and uh, that they'll explain that briefly and I could do you know a whole hour on that actually <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what I have no doubt of that and uh, I might actually have to bring you back for that because I don't think I know anyone else who has actually uh, studied with Dr. Suzuki I mean do you ever have any uh, opportunity to talk to him about more than violin um, being in his presence was kind of like I, I don't even know how to explain it. It, it. He was simultaneously a teacher, but a very, very wise man, almost to a point of being mystical. Um, so having individual conversations was not quite an appropriate thing in that <laughs> But he would, uh, you know, occasionally just walk up to you randomly and ask some question, and you would just think, how did he know that about me? Or how, how did he think, how did he know I was thinking about that? Um, so, yes, I mean, there are a lot of, of little stories from my time there that could be told that are, that are very interesting. Um, he was... He, he will go down in history as one of the greatest men who've ever lived. I mean, what he did was so transformative to so many people in such a profound way um, 
that that I, I believe he's truly one of the great men. Uh, I mean, I would put him in the category of Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Jefferson, Shinichi Suzuki, uh, just you know that level of profound greatness. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was there. He was eighty two uh, to eighty five, so he was quite young still comparatively. He taught all the way up to about the last couple of years of his life. He died at ninety nine. Oh wow! And um, just a tremendous visionary, tremendous. Um, and and the whole story of how he came up with Suzuki method is is fascinating as well. You know, how did he get these ideas? He noticed that all Japanese children learn to speak Japanese. They do it pretty much effortlessly. <laughs> they do it pretty much completely by the age yep. of six or seven. They they develop an ease of doing that, and no one else in the world can do that except a Japanese child. Why is that? And so he noticed, well, they have the advantage of living in Japan, so they're constantly surrounded by that. They have the advantage of starting at a young age. Uh, they have the advantage of, of having mother coach them one-on-one, -on -one, and they have the advantage of a methodology that requires mastery. They learn a word, they say the word again and again until you think, is a kid ever going to learn another word? And then they learn a second word, and they use those two, and, and then they learn a third, and they use those three, and they learn these words, and they keep using all the words they've ever learned, and they never stop. Whereas what we do educationally is we learn something, and we go forget it. Right? Then we learn something else and forget it, learn something else, forget it. We go through 12 years of school, and and much of the stuff that we learned, we intentionally forgot because we had no no further application. There was no mastery learning. So Suzuki method is based on those principles. Kids listen to recordings, so that creates an environment where they can absorb music more easily. They start at a young age with these little violins with you know kids three and a half, four, five years old. These two ideas were absolutely revolutionary in the world of music education in the early 1900s. I mean, no one would have ever thought to do that. He teaches the parent how to teach the child, which again is is completely different than the way things were. And you you play every piece you've learned and you never stop playing the pieces that you've learned so that you keep getting better and better and better at and the more music you have memorized, the easier it is to memorize new music. So those are your four pillars right there in brief. That's fascinating and I, I didn't know that and uh, I mean I should so I'm actually very interested in going after teenagers at at this time in their life where their their nonlinear thinking is beginning to develop and ask them to do amazing things because at some level the teenage brain is actually similar again to its to the brain when it's young you kind of have mm -hmm. a second opportunity to learn some amazing new things if you'll take the opportunity to do it my idea is to pull back the bowstring as far as possible and see how far can we launch this teenager with you know into their life if we could you know if we could catch them when they're young mm -hmm. I so agree I so agree thank you so much Andrew this was an unexpected gift on a Friday thank you <laughs> all right we'll talk to you later Andrew